Space tech is an industry which is really growing, and there are many companies out there who are talking about very exciting things happening in the not-so-distant future. So today, we're talking to Joel Sassel, the president and CEO of TransAstra Corporation, to talk about mining in space and what it could mean for the future of spaceflight and humanity. Don't forget to get in touch with us. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please do hit that share button to help us out. But right now, this is episode 113 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 113 of the Space and Things podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I am doing great, uh, especially since I've gotten my hands on probably one of the biggest book releases of the year. I finally got my copy of Apollo Remastered last night. And I tell you what, it's been very difficult to stay focused on my day job today because <laughs> it's just exquisite, like from start to finish. Does it live up to the hype? Yes. If the book was just Apollo 9 by itself or Apollo 15 by itself, it would live up to the hype. I mean, if you love Apollo, to me, it's like seeing it in color for the first time. And the pictures are so beautifully remastered that you feel like some of them you're like man I, this looks like it was just taken yesterday you know yeah i feel like i can just reach in and touch it just a beautiful book from from cover to end so yeah definitely uh, get it if not think about it for the holidays yeah absolutely in my opinion it's already the book of the year and we've had some really good releases this year so that's high praise in my opinion uh the title just sells it for me and does exactly what it says in the tin as well. Apollo Remastered. You're looking at the Apollo program with fresh eyes. Exactly. That's what this book does. It's quite something. Something you've seen many times before or think you've seen many times before. And you're seeing it as if you've never seen it before. Yeah, because I mean, I'm like, you know, oh, I've been reading about Apollo for years, you know, and you think you've seen everything. And then it's like these photos. It's like you have it. I feel like I've never seen any of this. The moon pictures, I mean, just the the vistas and the panoramas. I mean, it's just like, oh, my God. I mean, it looks like you could just step into it, which is incredible. For a book, it's very immersive. The picture of them in Apollo 9 where it's um, the full crew lined up in there. You know what picture I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like almost three-dimensional. Like, you get a sense of what it really looked like in there. Like, you could almost step in there and hang out with them. (laughs) Absolutely. It's so immersive. It's very much a book. And I think this gets to the core of what this book's about. It's a book from the perspective of the people that flew on Apollo. I don't even think there's a launch photo in there. It's the photos that they took. So it's from their eyes. It's like you're looking at it from their eyes. Yes, I think there's one uh, photo of the moon from one of the instruments uh, that was on the side of the command module, but the rest... I'm pretty sure, you know, obviously there were some cameras that were allowed to float free or, or were pinned uh, by the astronauts. But pretty much it's their perspective. You're seeing what it was like in those spacecraft and then being on the moon. And I like that that's how he's focused this book. It's it's focused on their experience. I think that's really special. And the way he's just the way he's done it as we've gone on for far too long now. It's just a very, very special book. This is kind of gothic sounding. I was reading the book last night sort of in the half dark you know and i was um because it was evening here by the time i got it and uh i was listening to the cure right (laughs) of all things the cure disintegration album and for some the music really fit it because it's kind of this dark landscape but not like dark like depressing sort of dark but with joyousness as well i don't know very weird it was a neat it was kind of a weird experience doing that but yeah, the music kind of fit what I was experiencing at yeah. the time. Yeah. Do you know that would actually be a cool experiment? If anyone has got the book, let us know what you listen to whilst you're reading it or flicking through it, because I think that could really enhance the experience. That'd be quite an interesting experiment. Anyway, let's get on with this week's main feature. With so much going on in the world of spaceflight, both with historic anniversaries and with current affairs, it's sometimes difficult to look forward. So that's what we're going to start to try and do. So today, 
we're talking to Joel Sassel, the CEO of Trans Astra Corporation. Joel is a proven space technology pioneer. He got his undergraduate degree in engineering physics in Arizona. Way back in 1984, he finished that and he wanted to start his own space company to build solar thermal rockets. But after seeking some advice, he instead took a job offer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is in California, in order to gain some more experience. And while he was there, he picked up a PhD from the California Institute of Technology. And while doing that, he literally did every job at JPL, from junior level engineer to principal engineer, from project manager to program manager. And he was the chief architect in JPL's end-to-end engineering process. He was there for 14 years in total and then moved on to do some more entrepreneurial work. He also holds the record for funding from NASA's Innovative Advanced Concept Scheme. A trans Astra Corporation believe that asteroids can provide enough raw materials to support a trillion people spread throughout the solar system. With these resources and the energy of the sun, they hope to move heavy industries to space, preserve Earth's biosphere, and provide an infinite future for our species. All right, let's find out how. Let's speak to Joel Sassel. Okay, we're off to a good start, Flight Cool. So, welcome, Joel. Thank you so much for joining us on Space and Things. So, Let's set the scene. Has there been any minor lunar mining, even if it's perhaps just sampling, that makes the idea of lunar mining exciting? Sure. I mean, uh, lunar mining is exciting. I mean, we've been scooping and sampling lunar regolith since the early 1960s with the Surveyor Program. So um, there's no doubt that you can there's, you can work with lunar regolith and extraterrestrial materials. So what kinds of materials and elements uh, make the idea of lunar mining viable if humans, say, wanted to start building like moon habitats or something like that? Well, you know, lunar mining and asteroid mining really are very different with very different goals and objectives. And the types of materials that you would get are very different. So. We now know that there are billions of tons of water frozen into the dark places on the moon where the sun never goes. And the cool thing about that, it's not just water, it's also methane and carbon dioxide and other volatile chemicals. The cool thing about that is we need water to make rocket propellant in space. So there's a lot of practical value to harvesting water on the moon. I don't know if I would really call it mining, I would more call it harvesting. And so Transastra has some inventions that we've been paid by NASA to mature. And we partner with various different really cool companies like Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos aerospace company. And then lunar materials are really cool from a perspective that people don't think about very much anymore. And that is the amount of energy that's required to launch from the surface of the moon is a small fraction of the amount of energy that's required to launch from the Earth. And the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So if you're going to be launching uh, supplies into space from a planetary surface, it's hundreds of times easier to do that from the surface of the moon than the Earth because you can use electromagnetic launchers, basically like a a linear motor or railgun to launch things from the moon. And then you could build mega structures like habitats that humans could live in that are kilometers in scale out of material launched up from the surface of the moon. So really, if you're talking about mining on the moon and you're serious, you're talking about two things, water and then regolith for radiation shielding for human habitats. People sometimes talk about other stuff on the moon, like helium-3. Helium-3 is a form of helium that in theory would be cleaner to burn in a nuclear reactor. Mark me down as skeptical on that one for two reasons. One is I have a PhD in, the, in, a, in basically in plasma physics, and um, I used to work on nuclear fusion. I think nuclear fusion is really, really hard, much harder than people realize. And helium-3 fusion is even harder, and there's not very much helium-3 on the moon. So I, I'm mark me down as skeptical, but willing to be convinced on that. Now, on the other hand, asteroids, that's a completely different thing in terms of mining. So the uh, material that's available in asteroids is much more diverse than the material that's available on the moon. Moon has its regolith, which is made mostly of 
aluminum and oxygen, very useful materials. It has water. And then it has a smattering of a whole bunch of other stuff. But the asteroids are much richer in a lot of that other stuff. The asteroids have water, always going to be very important in space. And that's what we're going to start with. And the asteroids have the advantage that you have to, even though it's much launch, easier to launch things off the surface of the moon than off the surface of the Earth, to get to the surface of the moon, you still have to soft land a spacecraft. And to get people to and from the moon, you can't do that on electromagnetic launchers. So there, the moon has the disadvantage of being a planetary body, whereas asteroids don't have gravity whales to wor worry about. And asteroids have things that the moon doesn't have in quantity. They have carbon, some nitrogen, not a lot, but enough. And nitrogen is super important for humans. Um, metals, there's lots of metals on the moon, but different types of metals on the asteroids, including a lot of iron and nickel and that sort of thing. And eventually, not right away, but the asteroids have rare earth metals that are extremely valuable, which someday we'll be harvesting from the asteroids. Now, transastra's focus initially is on water and the other volatile materials that you can make rocket propellant out of. In fact, we have a patent and we've tested in a laboratory a type of engine that we call the omnivore thruster that can use virtually anything as propellant. And we've shown that we can run the omnivore thruster on water as propellant. And it produces about 10 times as much thrust as other advanced electric uh, propulsion systems like electric propulsion systems. So that's a kind of a long-winded answer to the question, but I hope it gives you an idea of what the, what our thinking is on that. Absolutely. That's all really exciting, actually. Cool. I couldn't help but notice some of that sounds very like Gerard K. O'Neill-esque. Uh, you know, he was into the idea of lunar mass drivers and stuff like that. Were you a L5 Society person? I was. In fact, I knew Gerard O'Neill. What? I love him. I'm sorry. I'm still friends with uh, the guy who is his right-hand man, Greg Marinak, uh, who still is involved with Singularity University and works very closely with Peter Diamandes. He and I chat on the phone once in a while. And the uh, Space Studies Institute, actually back in the 80s, gave me my first consulting contract. Wow. So I used to, uh, I used to attend space, you know, space manufacturing conferences in Princeton and all that kind of stuff. That's so, incredible. Yeah, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in... Uh, not in the specific engineering implementation that Gerard O'Neill and his compatriots came up with, because the technology has changed since then, but with the basic idea. And the basic idea is really very powerful. And what it says is that there's enough material in the asteroids to build worlds with a thousand times the carrying capacity of the Earth. Actually, one of the one of the things that O'Neill did was he calculated that number based on our understanding of the mass of asteroids then, <laughs> and he came up with the number of three thousand Earths. It turns out there were big error bars, big uncertainty on the total mass of asteroids and that sort of thing. And now we know that we, there's only enough material in the asteroids to build the worlds with the carrying capacity of a thousand times a year. So there's still a factor of three or so uncertainty on that number. So let's say between three hundred and a few thousand. And where you get that number is you, you calculate the, the mass of the asteroids and then you say, in order for humans to live in space in an Earth normal environment with the same levels of radiation that you might have, say, in Denver, Colorado, where there's less atmosphere to protect you. But we know people can live in Denver, Colorado. You need a, somewhere between five and seven meters of shielding. So, you know, call it close to 20 feet of shielding. If you calculate the size of a wall that you could make, a radiation shield, out of all the asteroids. It comes out to a thousand times the surface area of the Earth. And then you can build those into hollow structures and spin them for gravity and fill them with air. And now you have places for people to live in space, which is Earth normal environment. And that's the only way to create an Earth normal environment in space. And so it's the only way we know that will be safe for people to live in space. People are adapted to live in an Earth normal environment, not adapted to live on the moon or Mars. And so if you want to say definitively that I know that people can live in space, it's an O'Neill type colonies. Now, we talk about that for fun a lot at Transastra, <laughs> but it's not just for fun. It's also the vision that motivates us. 
is this idea of humanity moving into space in wickedly large numbers with this unlimited horizon. You know, O'Neill called it the high frontier, a frontier that goes for a thousand years, you know, enough to support a population of a trillion people living in good quality lives, not squalor or poverty, but with health and vitality in a wealthy environment. And we do believe that, that as O'Neill did, that that is the long range prospect for humanity's progeny, for whatever it is that we evolve into. That's the place for us to evolve and exponentiate and grow. We don't spend a lot of engineering time and effort on that at Transastra because we know it's feasible from a scientific and engineering perspective in the long term, but it's a long term prospect. But what we have done is we've thought about what are the critical technologies that would be most important in moving us in that direction and moving the needle of history? And then what we've done is we've invented those technologies. We've written proposals to NASA and we've been very lucky winning millions of dollars of NASA money to reduce these inventions to practice in our lab. And now every one of these inventions has near-term commercial prospects today. And those prospects are all, all about space. And they fall into a few different categories. One is, if you're going to be a spacefaring civilization, living and working in space, you need to be able to see around you, find other spacecraft, and find asteroids and other things in space that you need to live on the land. So we invented a type of telescope that we call the Sutter Telescope. We wrote proposals to NASA. NASA funded them. Now we've built the Sutter telescopes, which, which we think are a revolution in the science and engineering of finding moving bodies in space. And we're using that them every night we're discovering new asteroids. Well, we're observing dozens and dozens of asteroids every night, finding at asteroids, and we're discovering new asteroids. But what's cool about Sutter, in addition to that, is that we can also do things like track spacecraft out beyond the moon. We can see spacecraft very, very easily in geostationary orbit and beyond. And this is a very important commercial thing today, and it's a very important practical problem for, say, the Space Force and for NASA. They need to keep track of debris and traffic in space. So this general field is called space domain awareness. So our Sutter telescope technology has real um, applications today, and we're operating our Sutter telescopes at observatories in Tucson and California, and we're planning on flying them in space. Um, is it obvious why we call them the Sutter telescopes? No. Sutter's mill was a mill in central California where an immigrant from Switzerland named Sutter had built a trading post, and they needed to to mill their flour, I guess it was. Maybe it was a lumber mill. I actually don't know. <laughs> um, but the foreman was dig. I've been to Sutter's Mill. If you get a chance in Central California to go visit it, definitely do so. Um, but they were looking at the water wheel and they were digging out in the stream that powered the water wheel and they reached in and they pulled up nuggets of gold. <laughs> that was the discovery of gold in California. That led to the California gold rush. Right. The settlement of California, the American West, and, you know, the United States is an economic superpower, law, techno, you know, everything that followed from that. So we think the Sutter Telescope will find so many asteroids that are so easy to get to that it will usher in a gold rush to space, which is why we call it the Sutter Telescope. So that's one of several Makes technologies sense. that we're, we're developing that really are enabling to a future of humanity living in space, but have near-term commercial applications that we're using to grow the company right now in the space business. Cool. Whoa. That's pretty crazy to think about, actually. Which brings me on to timelines for some of the technology you're working on. You said the telescopes are operational now, but what about the rocket you said earlier could run on any fuel, the omnivore thruster? Is that operational? I know you said you've done lab tests. And then how quickly do we think we'll see mining happening on another celestial body? Have you got any idea of timelines at all for any of this? Well, in terms of the technical ability and the engineering, we could be mining asteroids in five to seven years. Wow. It's really all about money. 
And in order to build the company to have the ability to do that, we're commercializing some of the technology that's directly applicable. So for example, you made reference to the omnivore thruster. We originally invented the omnivore thruster with an eye towards, if we send a harvesting vehicle to an asteroid to harvest water from the asteroid, and we're gonna you know, collect 100 tons of water, how do we get that water back? If it's a chemical rocket, we bring enough chemical propellant there to bring the 100 tons back, it takes a lot more than we harvested to get back. If it's electric propulsion, it would take 20 or 30 years to get there and back with electric propulsion systems. So we invented this engine that we call the omnivore thruster, which is a type of solar thermal rocket. And in the omnivore thruster, you have these very simple, inexpensive solar concentrators. There's some not so simple, subtle, and technologically advanced ways that the concentrators collect the sun and direct the sun's energy onto the thruster. But it heats up the thruster. Now, if you didn't pass, if you didn't have rocket propellant with you, in this case, water, and you put that much sunlight on the thrust, thruster, it would melt in a matter of seconds. It would vaporize and melt. But what we do instead is we, we use water as the rocket propellant. We run the water into the thruster. It keeps the thruster from melting, but the, rocket, the water heats to ultra high temperatures and then it gets squirted out the rocket nozzle to produce thrust. That's how the omnivore thruster works. Right. And it works with other propellants too. Basically, any liquid that you can think of that is a volatile liquid that boils, uh, and think about household liquids, you know, like ammonia. If you, you probably don't have hydrazine in your house. That's a rocket propellant, but if you did, <laughs> um, or like different types of alcohols, all kinds of different things like that, or mixtures. So some of our patents and some of our pending patents on the omnivore thruster are how it works with all different propellants. And it can also work as a chemical rocket. So we can run it as a chemical rocket for really high thrust. We can augment that chemical rocket with sunlight to reduce its propellant consumption. Or we can run it just on sunlight and an inert propellant like water. That's, that's the cool thing about the omnivore thruster. So we invented it for asteroid mining but it's a tremendously practical and cost-effective solution for today's orbital logistics market. Logistics is carrying payloads in space from where rockets drop them off to where they need to go so that they don't have to carry their own expensive propulsion systems. So uh, we invented Omnivore for asteroid mining. We're developing our worker bee line of orbit transfer vehicles, space trucks, for today's orbital logistics market and starting in low Earth orbit. And then when we have our worker bees working, you know, flying the, the routes of low Earth orbit in today's market, we'll be able to equip them with asteroid mining equipment, send them to asteroids and bring back the rocket propellant that supplies the worker bees themselves. Well, you're blowing my mind a little bit here, Joe. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to switch the subject a little bit because I know that some of our listeners may have the same thoughts as me here. Are there any ethical issues, which perhaps you're already talking about within the industry, which are associated with mining on other celestial bodies? There's the argument that we don't look after this planet very well, for example. Why should we go and take things from other places? Exactly. I think it's really important to consider the ethical implications of these things. We're doing better and better at looking after the planet all the time. And the best way for us to to do even better at looking after the planet is develop cl more advanced, cleaner technologies. More advanced technologies tend to be more efficient, naturally cleaner. If you care about that, as you're developing new technologies, you'll do a better job with that. But even still, you know, like there's like 7.8 billion people on the planet and they need to eat and they need shelter and they need transportation. And these things take energy and materials and, and harvesting them from the, the planet where we're competing with the other living things on the planet, there's, a, there's an ethical question about that because if we damage the biosphere, drive species to extinction, they're not gonna be around for future generations to appreciate. And it's not about putting the environment over humanity, it's about appreciating the importance of preserving it for future generations. And that principle is, uh, just as active when you start thinking about the space domain. So a lot of people, when they start to think about space, is like, 
oh, good, we can go into space. There's no biosphere to pollute, so we don't have to be careful about what we're doing. Well, that's not quite true. You have to think about not ruining it for future generations. We're already messing up a little bit on that with uh, low Earth orbit, where the debris environment is getting pretty dicey. And it's probably going to get more dicey in the future. I mean, it's kind of nasty that the Russians actually did an ASAT, an anti-satellite test, Mm -hmm. and blew up a spacecraft in an orbit that just happens to bombard lots of low Earth orbit spacecraft, especially like the SpaceX Starlink constellation, with debris all the time. And it's just irresponsible behavior. So we need to do better. But everywhere we go in space, there's if, if we go and there might be a biosphere, then we should be very careful. You know, how would you like to have your legacy be, well, there was a biosphere on Mars, but we found it and we accidentally drove it to extinction because we didn't understand it, right? Mm. So before we hang out at a place that may, ha- may have a biosphere, that a lot of scientists think have a biosphere, has a biosphere, or had a prehistoric biosphere that we don't understand, let's take really good care of that so that future generations of scientists and philosophers can benefit from that. And then there's things like, if you land a big rocket on the moon with rocket engines that are down near the bottom of the rocket, it can kick debris up at hypervelocity, you know, much faster than a high-powered rifle bullet. In fact, Phil Metzger and many other people have, have started to do calculations that show that you can actually put debris into orbit by landing. So then you're creating an orbital debris cloud that comes back and bombards the place that you landed, especially if you landed near a pole. So like one of the principles should be before you land more than a couple landers on the moon, if they're big landers with high performance rocket engines, you have to put landing pads in place so that you're not creating a debris environment that's bombarding everybody. And so that's about stewardship of the environment because you value humanity and future generations. That's why you do it. Likewise, when we're harvesting asteroids, we have to get to the point where we're using the whole asteroid. I think it's very unwise to talk about harvesting resources from planetary bodies that may have life. You know, let's just make that a rule. Until we know it doesn't have life, we don't go there. Once we know it it does have life, we put a wide berth around it. And, and, you know, we don't consider terraforming planets that might have biospheres. That, that should be, you know, like rule number one, for example. And then the other thing is, you know, there are countries in this world that don't really respect human rights. You know, look what's going on in Iran, yeah. China, Russia. And these are technical, technologically advanced countries. You know, China's space program is catching up to the United States. It may surpass us soon. And they don't respect human rights. They don't respect the freedom of assembly. They don't respect the franchise for everybody, uh, freedom of speech. And as we move into space, we want to make sure that the folks who respect freedom of assembly, free markets, so that the people who take the risks and do the hard work can benefit from that. Um, So it's very important, in my view, that these things be thought through carefully. And that's why, you know, I've written, I've written essays on this. There's, if people go to my LinkedIn profile, Joel Sircell on LinkedIn, you'll see the post that I have at the top of my LinkedIn profile is an essay on space ethics that I wrote with my good friend, the awesome uh, General Steve Quast, that covers many of these aspects of space, space ethics. So what it means is that there's going to have to be the right level of proper regulation of business as we go in here. Today, so often, in so many matters, it's the extremes that drive everything, right? There are people who say there can't be any regulation or destroy business in space. Well, that's an extreme position. There's another thing that only governments should go, or it should be heavily regulated to make sure that no one ever makes a mistake. Well, if you're not willing to make a mistake and take a risk, you're not going to do anything. So a moderate level of regulation is still very encouraging to private sector. And then there's coordinated with international partners, I think is very important so that people don't go up there, commit travesties and ruin it for everybody. And then the overregulators will have a case and they'll shut everything down. Mm. Okay. I have one quick follow-up to that, if that's okay. Sure. 
This is such a fascinating area. It's almost like the world has to write a constitution for space and everyone has to agree, which is, seems impossible. Anyway, I know that's what the Artemis Accords is starting to try and do, but not many have signed up to that yet. Anyway, I was talking to my girlfriend about what you guys are planning on doing and said that the basic idea was that there are resources on the moon and asteroids which can be used to build things in space at a much lower cost that could help humanity survive, etc. And she said, wouldn't mining on the moon just ruin the moon for all of us down here? And I sympathise with that. And I think a lot of people on Earth would agree that, that you wouldn't want to ruin the beauty of the moon for those looking at it. I had my own answer to her for that question, but I wonder what you would say to someone who says that. Well, you know, there's a there, there's a principle, like, for example, in bioethics, when you're doing early trials on human populations, like you can't say, well, I have this drug that I'm going to test. I tested it out on some animals. It's ready for phase one trials. And, you know, no one in L.A. really wants to sign up for this. So we're going to go to this other country where people really need money and pay them to do these trials. So that's considered unethical for good reason. Mm. And that is. There's a principle that when you're going to do these things, everyone who's affected in it has to have at least some reasonable voice. Okay, That doesn't mean they have veto power, but there's got to be a balanced perspective here on this. So the, the issue of, let's say I'm mining on the moon and I'm changing the, the look of the face of the moon. By the way, I think it's a very long time until that could happen. Yeah. Like If that happens, it means mining on the moon is going really great. <laughs> and, and when it starts to be that it might change how it looks, let's have that conversation. Yeah. So this is a theoretical thing for the future. But, it's, but here's what's not theoretical. It's just real like that. The Russians are talking about building constellations of satellites that form billboards in, in, in the sky. You're out on the beach, you're up in the mountain looking at the night sky, and then, then some Russian company's logo goes floating by in the cosmos, affecting everyone on the planet. Sorry. That's something that we need to discuss. Yeah. Likewise, people are building massive constellations of satellites in low Earth orbit that can interfere with astronomy. Now, astronomy isn't a giant trillion-dollar business, but it's an important part of human endeavor. And so, you know, like Elon has painted his Starlink satellites a darker color, so they interfere less with astronomy. Now, just because you affect anything like you can go outside in the night sky and look up and see the space station go by or lots of satellites. It doesn't ruin the night sky. So it's a matter of degree and reasonableness here. So we do need to have those discussions. Personally, I often go outside on a moonlit night. And it's clear and I look at the moon and I think, wouldn't it be awesome if when you're looking at that crescent moon and there's the dark part in the crescent, what if there were diamonds sprinkling there where the cities on the moon were looking back at us? Uh, yeah. I think that would be beautiful <laughs> and awesome, and I hope it happens. And there would be purists who say anything that changes the way the moon looks is not okay. And there would be extremists who would say anything you want to do to the moon, you should. Well, like in most things in life, there's a balance in between. That would be my take on it. What was your take on it? The images you see from space of the Earth, you don't see the cities. You don't see the what humans have done. You only see blue and green and brown. As you said, it would have to be a ridiculous level of mining and it'd have to have gone ridiculously well for it to ever have made an impact on what we see, really. And the other thing was there's the whole other side of the moon, which we don't see anyway, so you could always just do it there. They were my two basic ideas of, how I thought to answer the question. Yeah, it's true. A human eye from the moon can't see human activity on the earth. Yeah. But it's absolutely true that you can see human activities on the earth. And even an astronaut looking out the window of the space station can see the border between California and Mexico. Oh, wow. There's a distinct line where it's green above the border and less green below the border. And that has to do with cultural differences between the two countries. So there are cases like that. Other people have said that they can see the Great Wall of China, for example. But in the main, I completely agree with your perspective. Excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So here's a little departure from the last question. But um, and, and finally, uh, where do you see your company in 10, 20 years or so? Doing our best. <laughs> yes. 
in 10 years, you know, I see us being a multi-billion dollar company with many, many space tugs in orbit, carrying payloads of all different size throughout cislunar space and um, harvesting hundreds of tons of water from the asteroids every year. And then once we have started harvesting water from the asteroids to use as propellant in space, it will be as cheap to get around in space as air travel. Once that happens, it makes sense to go to those asteroids to do things that would be unimaginable today, like harvesting precious metals and bringing the precious metals back to the Earth. And anyone who's proposing to build a spacecraft like the ones we build today, using the economics of today, where you launch a spacecraft into orbit on a rocket like a Falcon 9, and then it uses chemical or electric rockets and flies to an asteroid, processes you know, precious metals and brings those precious metals back. They just haven't thought about the economics and the engineering details carefully enough. That's not practical. What we have to do is we have to we have to build more a solid a more solid industrial foundation in space to make it more cost effective to get around in space. But when we're harvesting water from the asteroids in large quantities in hundred ton quantities, using it as rocket propellant, then it's so cheap to get around in space that it makes sense to harvest precious metals. And at that point, it's a multi-trillion dollar proposition. So. The world that we're talking about in 20 years is a world where space industry is a giant fraction of total GDP of the Earth, gross domestic product, Tri- many, many, many trillions of dollars. So I think space companies will be the biggest companies in the world in that time frame. Because wow. to make useful goods and services for people, you need three things, matter, energy, and information or intelligence. And the matter and energy that are available in space far outstrip what's available on the Earth and are easier to harvest. Harvesting resources from asteroids and and microgravity is much easier than harvesting by digging holes in hard rock on the ground. And solar energy is not very efficient on the Earth. You know, like I have a 10 kilowatt solar array on my house. Over the course of a year, it only averages like 30 kilowatt hours a day. But if it was in space, it would be averaging 240 kilowatt hours of electric output per day. And the other thing is in space, you can harness that solar energy as raw solar power just by using solar concentrators for industrial processes. And then the information comes from the human mind and our computers and our communications networks. And so for all those reasons, we have every reason to believe that the space economy will eventually vastly outstrip the terrestrial economy. And exactly how soon that happens is anyone's guess. But uh, Transaster is here to be one of the leaders in that field. Awesome. This is so cool. This is blowing my mind a little bit. Just that time frame, 20 years. I, I just look back at 20 years ago from now, 2002, and I look to where we are now. And what you're talking about is happening in 20 years I mean, that's such exponential growth in what we're, what we're doing, not just in terms of the money made, but, but in terms of what's actually being achieved. I'm not saying it can't happen. It's just blowing my mind. Dave, what about the 20 years leading up to the first people traveling in space? Yeah. Let's say, let's say the mid-60s was early space program. In the mid-1940s, we had propeller airplanes. In the 20 years before that, we had biplanes. So what's happened is progress has been remarkably slow for the last few decades. It's been <clears throat> stagnated because the United States has been, has been the force that drives rapid technological evolution. But in the aerospace industry, it's been stagnated by the military industrial complex, which spends more and more to do less and less every year. And so, for example, looping back to the beginning of this conversation, one of my early mentors was this fella, Gerard O'Neill, Jerry O'Neill. And he was basing his assumptions on human space settlements, that the space shuttle worked. The space shuttle never worked. Yeah. The space shuttle was designed to be safe, routine, and affordable. It was none of those things. It was the most expensive rocket ever done. 
they say it was reusable, but it was really refurbishable by thousands and thousands of engineers. And because the space shuttle never fulfilled its promise, all the exciting things that should have happened in space never did. The reason it's starting to get exciting is because SpaceX has been doing a great job developing reusable rockets. And now many others are following. In fact, Jeff Bezos started that process before Elon did. And I do believe that Blue Origin will be successful with their new Glenn. It'll be a really cool, low-cost reusable rocket. And then other companies, like my good friends at Stoke, is this cool breakthrough rocket company with all these wicked technologies that are way beyond even the SpaceX Starship. So we're going to see low-cost access to space. The cost has already come down by factors of several. And they're going to come down by factors of several more. When that happens, we're going to see massive industries opening up in space. And so it's been delayed artificially. Right. And so now it's time to get back to the future. And that's where we're ending. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joel. Awesome. This has been absolutely amazing. This conversation has gone well beyond where I thought it was going to go. So thank you so, so very much for spending some time with us. Great. Thanks for the great questions. Peace. When people put their minds to it, they can make things happen extraordinarily fast. The whole Apollo project was not even 10 years from the start of the concept to the successful realization. Almost anything that's technically within present possibility can be done within a 10 year time span when people set their minds to it. That was awesome. That was freaking amazing. Yeah, I wasn't expecting Gerard K. O'Neill to show up. He shows up everywhere. Now, that was amazing. There, it, there, it there is. he is. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, th And that blows my mind that, you know, the last question, 20 years, you know, that's in our lifetime. You know, that's something that's fully achievable. And it, it, wow, I'm just blown away. I, I would love to see that, you know, multi spacecraft built in space from space infrastructure with multi generational missions in space if that makes sense yeah he's right though isn't it you, you look at it and there was in, in in terms of aerospace there was just a pause yep like it just stopped developing anywhere near as quickly as it was before that and we look at it in terms of our lifetime in our lifetime not that much has changed in terms of aerospace other than perhaps the reusable rockets which have now got and landing rockets vertically yeah. and things like that but that even that's not a zillion miles away from what they were doing before and the idea was there. But what he's talking about in 20 years is a long way. It's a lot, you know, we've just got excited because we crashed into an asteroid for the first time and he's saying within 20 years, he's going to be putting different rockets on there, harvesting various minerals and all kinds yeah, of stuff. Water. And then, then being able to come home again. Exactly, yeah. I don't want to point fingers, but I do feel, I do agree with you that space you know sort of progress in space technology was kind of stagnated for a long time and i like i said i don't want to point fingers at you know what happened because in the early 80s there were people who were you know dreamers who wanted to pioneer commercial space flight but i feel like in a lot of ways they were sort of held back there were things that you know it wasn't their fault we'll just put it that way so i do agree that it was kind of stagnated and what he said about, you know, a lot of O'Neill's ideas were awesome, but they were dependent on space shuttle infrastructure in the late 70s and early 80s. And unfortunately, the, I, while I loved the space shuttle, it didn't quite live up to what it was, what O'Neill was hoping, I think it, it would be. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and I've heard other people say that a lot of what these space industries now are talking about are all dependent on Starship working, for example. But then you hear what Joel's talking about and you realise it's not just SpaceX who are doing it, though, is it? Yeah. You've got other commercial companies coming in. You've got New Glenn, which is about to, yep. well, hopefully soon come along. And so you've got two big companies. You've got other companies also building rockets and and coming up with new ideas for how to, how to have private enterprise and rockets and things like that. So it's not like we're only relying on one thing anymore, is it? Whereas yeah. Gerardo O'Neill at that point was relying on the space shuttle. Exactly. In the United States in the 70s and in the late 70s, they really put their eggs in one basket. And then, you know, there were companies that had ideas like, okay, we're going to build our own vehicles commercially. You know, we're going to have privately funded rockets. 
But I think history shows that they were held back a lot because NASA was like, oh, we can do this for free. We can just launch commercial stuff on our space shuttle. So why would you want to have a rocket? You know? Yeah. And I, and I hate saying that because I love the shuttle. But now there are so many players in the industry. There, There's not just one. You know, there's a lot of different possibilities, which is just mind blowing. I read a book this year called Liftoff by Eric Berger, and it's about the early days of SpaceX. And he talks within it about what the industry was like. And you had these heritage companies um, that built the spacecraft of the old days. And they t- like there was kind of an old boys club. I may have put that word, that phrase into Berger's mouth there, but that's how he kind of explained it. You know, helping each other out, helping your mates out, putting your friends in different places, in different industries. So essentially things just got passed around amongst a few people and it was almost impossible to break into that. And it needed someone to come in and absolutely smash up the industry, uh, disrupt the industry, I think is the term they use. And you can see why it happens. Because you know, because people know people and they're like, oh, I know that person. Yep. I'm going to hire that person. Absolutely. And of course, it's not just Elon Musk who has disrupted this industry. As Joel said, Jeff Bezos has done it. There's other companies out there that have done it. Uh, And bit by bit, people are coming in and saying, no, we need to stop doing this and we need to be innovative and we need to let new ideas in. We've got people like Paul Allen and Richard Branson, you know, so many people. And then you've got so many companies now that we've never heard of. Getting big contracts from NASA. How many of our listeners before today would have actually have heard of Transastra Corporation? Yeah. I doubt that many. And yet here they are with these massive plans that are potentially achievable. It's a complete different world now. Yeah, but I'm hoping after this episode, you know, they've got thousands and thousands of more people who have heard of it because I I believe they're going to do awesome things. Yeah. And there's other companies out there as well doing yep. doing this kind of stuff. So this is a very cool, exciting time. We've been saying it for a while. This is a cool and exciting time to be following the space program. And it's from interviews like this that you can see why. Yep. It's cool stuff happening. Absolutely. Lots to follow. So as always, uh, the full video unedited is available on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And there'll be links to things we talked about within that interview in our show notes. So check those out as well on spaceandthingspodcast.com or check the link in the description of this podcast. There is boring soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. Hey, it is. I can see it from here. It's orange. Where did I put my visor up? Since we recorded last week, there have been four launches, two in Russia, one in Florida, and one in India. And as always, the full details of these launches, their payloads, and videos, if they exist, can be found on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, or check the link in the description of this podcast. There are plenty of launches planned for this week, too, including the first Falcon Heavy launch in three years. And, exciting for me, the first Virgin Orbit launch to start its journey in the UK down in Cornwall, which is quite exciting for us. Wow. So keep your eyes peeled on social media about those launches over the weekend. Yeah, the Falcon Heavy should be cool. Uh, hopefully I can see it from here. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, we'll see. It's on Halloween. We'll see. And while we're talking about SpaceX, the Polaris Dawn mission, which was scheduled for this autumn, has now been pushed to March 2023 at its earliest. This is the next private mission funded by Jared Isaacman, and they will be using a SpaceX Dragon capsule on their Falcon 9 rocket. You all remember that last year he commanded the Inspiration4 mission. Uh, Well, clearly that was the start for him, and he's got three more missions planned, the first of which is Polaris Dawn, which will attempt to reach the highest Earth orbit ever flown on a crewed mission, and it will also feature the first private spacewalk. Uh, The crew have been busy training, and it's not currently clear what the reason is for the delays, but March is not that far away. 
Nope, not at all. Also, while we're talking about SpaceX, this is uh, not so good news. I don't know if you saw this, Emily. It's been reported that earlier this year, there was an accident at the HQ in Hawthorne, California, which put one of their technicians in a coma for two months. Uh, SpaceX has been fined $18,475 for the incident by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. I don't know who gets that money, but it's gone somewhere. The engineer is called Francisco Cabada, and while he has come out of the coma, he is still unable to communicate and needs medical assistance to survive, which is obviously really tragic. There is a GoFundMe page which has been set up by his brother-in-law to help out his young family. I will obviously put the link for that in the show notes for those who are interested. Uh, that really is awful news. Yeah. yeah not good. <laughs> Well, uh, let's hope he improves and gets better. Absolutely. It's always difficult to follow a story like that and, and not sound horrible, but um, moving on, though. Uh, two NASA missions in Arizona have taken place this month to try and help their astronauts prepare for walking and working on the moon. Arizona was also used by the Apollo astronauts for a similar purpose. According to NASA officials, the Arizona desert possesses many characteristics that are analogous to a lunar environment including challenging terrain, interesting geology, and minimal communications infrastructure, all of which astronauts will experience near the lunar south pole during Artemis missions. Uh, NASA have been posting a daily field log of what the astronauts have been up to, and it looks like they've been having a great time. And of course, Dave will put that in the show notes. Show notes is going to be busy this week. Visually, one of the most spectacular things to come out this month was the image from JWST of the Pillars of Creation. It's likely that you've already seen this or that you've seen the old Hubble photos of this. Big dark clouds, looks like a big hand kind of thing, coming out of the Eagle Nebula, which is about 6,000 light years away. JWST has been able to penetrate those clouds and we're literally watching stars being born. It's Stunning image. Absolutely stunning. Uh, I think many people are excited about the idea of JWST taking photos of things which Hubble made famous. And it's certainly delivering some incredible things. It's such a beautiful image. It really took my breath away. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, there's yeah. really no way to some. <laughs> I'm trying to. I really cannot come up with coherent words to describe that image you know because it's just like the the universe is so huge it's just enormous and i don't think we have an any idea and finally nasa has started a oh no a ufo study <laughs> um, a 16 person team including former nasa astronaut scott kelly is looking at previously collected unidentified aerial phenomena to focus on how they could be better organized and analyzed in the future to help shed more light on the mysterious sightings Obviously, they're only going to look at the unclassified sightings, though. But NASA and UFOs, that, that's what we're ending on today. <laughs> yes, we are. I have the fireflies. That's it for this week. We hope that you've enjoyed our podcast. Thanks for listening. And as always, please consider hitting the share button if you've enjoyed it. Also, thanks to those who continue to support us on Patreon. We're closing in on 50 subscribers on there, which is very nice indeed. It was my hope that we might one day get to 100, but maybe I'm being a bit optimistic. I don't know. Anyway, you can get involved at patreon.com forward slash space and things. And a big thanks to those who have either just donated or purchased merchandise from our website. It's a massive help, and we hope you like your space and things swag. Uh, we'll also be back next week to talk about space medicine, but don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.